Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It gives you the tools and inspiration to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. This is where we explore how to cultivate remarkable cultures, cultures that scale and evolve as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. Blanket trust isn't a good thing. We are always thinking about trust in context. And I think it's one of the most important reframes for leaders and organizations because they're often saying, you know, I want people to trust me and I want people to trust our brand and our organization. And I always say, to do what? What are you trusted to do? And where is the gap? And where do you really need to earn that trust? And even thinking about that question, to do what? you can start to put things into action and practice. Hey friends, welcome to episode 120 of the Culture Lab podcast. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brain, a -a one-of-a-kind accelerator program where culture leaders get hands-on support and guidance on how to reach their goals faster, especially now in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. CultureBrain connects you with outstanding peers on the same journey, but also with world-class experts, including people you know from the show. And they all help you identify and implement new, better ways of creating a culture where people do their best work. Check it out at tinyurl.com forward slash culturebrain. And no need to write it down. There's a link in the show notes. So this is going to be personal. My husband was diagnosed with lung cancer a couple of months ago, and my whole world came crashing down. There's nothing scarier than when someone you love the most in the whole world receives such a frightening diagnosis. And the period when he was going through the initial assessment was absolutely terrifying. Not knowing what exactly you are dealing with really is the worst. Thankfully, we caught it early and he's on his way to full recovery. And I bring this deeply personal experience to the table because it leads us directly to a crucial aspect of our lives that we often overlook or take for granted. Trust. My guest today, Rachel Botsman, is a leading expert on trust, and she defines it as a confident relationship with the unknown. My husband's diagnosis and treatment made me reflect on this definition in ways I had never considered before. How we navigate the unknown, how we place our faith in others, how we muster the courage to face the uncertainties of situations we don't fully control, and how we take seemingly impossible decisions. All these aspects intertwine and rely on our ability to trust others. My personal experiences also shed light on the importance of the elements that contribute to trust. Rachel breaks trust down into competence, reliability, integrity, and empathy. Throughout our search for the right medical team, we encountered doctors who seemed competent, but not reliable. Then there were those who ticked the competence, reliability, and integrity boxes, but who lacked empathy. These early interactions were really unsettling and stressful, but they underscored the complexity of trust. We finally picked an oncologist who truly understood what mattered most to us. He recognized that athletic performance and quality of life were incredibly important for my husband, and he suggested a therapy that took these aspects into consideration. It was a profound moment where all the facets of trust came together, giving us the confidence and reassurance that we needed to move forward. In today's episode, we'll explore how to nurture trust at work including in remote and hybrid setups. We will talk about generational dynamics and trust, and also how to repair trust when it's broken. 
So join me as we embark on this journey to uncover the essence of trust, its fragility, its strength, and its undeniable importance in our lives. Without further ado, meet my wonderful guest. My name is Rachel Botsman. Uh, I guess the outside world calls me a trust expert, uh, which I find difficult to wear because I see myself far more as an experiential designer and an artist at heart that is trying to join the dots on why we behave in different ways and how culture influences those behaviors. Oh, I love this intro and welcome to the Culture Lab, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here. I am delighted to have you with us because the topic that is at the heart of your work is such an important one when it comes to cultivating a thriving company culture. So I really can't wait to dive in. But there's one question that I ask all of our guests, and so it's coming your way now. And the question is about your early days, perhaps your childhood. What were the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person? Oh, it's a good question. I like it also because I often think sort of people and ideas are shaped by different threads. And I think of sort of up to my late teens, there's three things that really stick in my mind. The first is I was an artist from a young age. I was always cutting things up and painting things and making things out of things I shouldn't have been making them out of and always in the art room at school. And this was how I saw the world through a visual lens. And it's interesting because I did very well at school in terms of grades and was under pressure to read law at Oxford and resisted that pressure to actually go and read fine art, which was the three best years of my life. It was just, I shouldn't actually say that. My husband wasn't in my life at that time, so, but it was. <laughs> So that's that's a really important thread. The second was I was a competitive swimmer until my mid-teens, and I had a choice to really go for that national level. And I realized that that's not what I wanted my life to be about. But I think I learned how to train for things. I learned discipline and persistence and working through pain, uh, which in some ways served me well later on in life. And I think the third important cultural thread was I was raised in a very Jewish home with very, very strong rituals. We never went out on a Friday night. We always celebrated the festivals. And figuring out where that fitted in my life later on uh, was sort of really a key question to my identity and my life now. Oh, gosh, this is so fascinating. And I'd love to be able to weave these three elements into our conversation going forward and unpack them a little bit. You mentioned introducing yourself, that you are often introduced as an expert in trust. And actually, I would say you are perceived as one of the top world's experts on trust. And you say you don't wear it comfortably. You'd much rather think of yourself as uh, a designer of experiences and, and someone who is doing this creative work where I can see where it's coming from. But nevertheless, I want to ask, as someone who is perceived as the world's top expert on trust, how does knowing so much about trust, because really trust is at the heart of your work, how does it affect your ability to trust others? <laughs> I mean, I've been studying this now for over 15 years. And there's a funny thing when you really immerse yourself in sort of one emotion, one topic is you think, oh, I know everything that I need to know. And then you hit a plateau and you're like, I know nothing. And then you, <laughs> I think one of the things I realized was that I was too trusting. And the reason why is, you know, I love connecting with people. I love sharing things. And when I was making important trust decisions, so who to hire on my own team, who to work with, I didn't slow down enough. And I think that's because if you're someone that is quite intuitive and creative, you can over rely on your intuition in those decisions. And I hadn't thought enough about the importance of information and the information that I was looking for in other people and the information actually that I really needed to know. And 
realizing that about myself was quite tough, but it opened up a whole new body of work of looking at the role of intuition versus information and this idea of trust signals. So how do we read people and decide whether we can trust them? So sometimes when you become self-aware of something in yourself, it can actually open up a whole new body of work and lead you to observing other people who have a similar trait. Yes, it's so true, isn't it? I think sometimes we say that actually the lessons that we need to learn are often the lessons that we start teaching. And it's such a beautiful way, I think, to dive deeper into a topic when you research it or start teaching it like yourself. And I think that to a great extent, many people that we've had on this show are really scratching their own itch with their work. And it seems to be the case in your case as well, to a certain extent. I don't know if it's too too of a difficult question to answer, Rachel, but given what you've said, in order to help us understand a little bit more about how you trust people and what you know already, who do you trust today and why in your life? I ask that question of other people. And (laughs) the interesting thing is, it's actually quite hard to form a list. But if you said, who don't you trust? It's instant right? It's like an emotional reaction. And this is interesting because distrust and trust, they have a different emotional wiring in our body. So the other thing that's really hard about that question is context, right? Trust is highly contextual. So you should trust people do some things in some situations, but not in other situations. So my husband, who I love dearly, if I was in a crisis or in any kind of physical danger, he is the person that I would call. He is solid and calm, the very opposite of me. If you want to get in a car, you get in a car with him. If you are in need, you call him, not me. Do I trust him with other things? <laughs> I won't go there. But... <laughs> like what? <laughs> Your husband definitely shouldn't listen to this interview, I think. <laughs> Managing money, right? Not his forte because <laughs> it's not how he thinks, right? So it's nothing against him. It's just I'm better at it. So this is a really personal example, but someone you deeply love and you can trust, you it's okay not to trust them in, in another context. Kat, who I work with and have worked with for five years, I trust deeply and implicitly. And she's actually a rare person where there is trust and loyalty. And those two things don't always go hand in hand. This is going to sound very strange, but I I have a real passion for gardening and my garden is my love. And I have this man called Bob who comes to help me for two hours a week. (laughs) And he always shows up, even like in the pouring rain, he is there. I, I can trust him because he really cares about what we're creating together. So they're just a few examples to show you sort of how wide trust stretches and I wouldn't trust Bob to take care of my children, right? Like he can help take care of the garden. So, but we missed this point. Blanket trust isn't a good thing. We are always thinking about trust in context. And I think it's one of the most important reframes for leaders in organizations because they're often saying, you know, I want people to trust me and I want people to trust our brand and our organization. And I always say, to do what? Yes. What are you trusted to do? And where is the gap? And where do you really need to earn that trust? And even thinking about that question, to do what, you can start to put things into action and practice. That is absolutely wonderful. And thank you for illustrating this notion of trust being contextual so clearly. I think really asking this question, as you say, what do we want people to trust us to do? can be really enlightening. As a business owner, I can immediately think of new perspectives are opening when I'm asking this question. So this is something very, very tangible that people can do. Can I add one other thing to that question? Because this question can be quite confronting and it can be quite empowering because it can highlight what we call a trust gap, right? So there's something you want to be trusted to do, but people don't quite trust you yet. And it can also be empowering because if you are trying to stretch into a new role, or you're trying to launch a new product and service, you're essentially asking for people's permission. And that requires trust. You're asking to interact with them in a different way. And so thinking about, okay, people trust me to do this, and I want them to trust me to do this. Oh, there's a gap there. 
what do I need to do or demonstrate to actually pull them along on that journey? It's a huge question. And it's, it's really actually what cultural change is about, is that you're asking people to sort of go from something that is known and familiar into the unknown with you. Yes. And it's incredibly applicable in shaping company culture, especially because, of course, trust is such a foundational element in company culture. And as a leader, if you ask yourself, what do people trust me to be able to do or be good at already? And where is that gap? And how do I need to bridge it immediately? I think you're getting more clarity around what needs to change and how you can strengthen that foundation. It's probably a good moment to introduce your definition of trust to our listeners. You have quite a unique definition of trust. How do you define it, Rachel? And and why is it so important to define it this way? So coming up with definition of trust was one of the hardest concepts to define. I love the fact that she trust has more definitions than love. So we can't even agree on what trust is. And every definition, I'm, I'm sort of preambling before I give my definition, but every definition I had read from social science and anthropology and business was about knowing what to expect of people, knowing how things were going to turn out. And something really bothered me about that definition, because if there's very little risk and you know the outcome of something and something is almost certain, you don't really need a lot of trust. And so my definition of trust, which actually came to me when I was watching Cirque du Soleil, you know, when they throw each other across the stage yes. <laughs> and you're like, oh, those moments, like catch them, catch them. Yeah. <laughs> so I started to go, ooh, well, when you control things, that's often a sign of lack of trust. But when you let go and there's that fast unknown, that's the very essence of trust. So my definition of trust is that trust is a confident relationship with the unknown. And when you see trust through this lens, you start to understand why it's this remarkable force in our lives that enables us to take leaps into the unknown, to navigate uncertainty, to place our faith and confidence in systems that we don't entirely understand and strangers that we've never met. And there is no other social glue. There is no other social force that plays uh, that role in our lives. And that's why I'm sort of obsessive and passionate about it, because I think sometimes we don't appreciate the role of trust until it's gone. And what I love about this definition, if I understand this correctly, is that it also implies that we need to be able to trust ourselves, not just external forces or individuals, but it's a relationship with the unknown that we ourselves have. And I understand our ability and capability to deal with it. Is that what you mean by this? It's a very astute question. And again, one of those realizations when uh, I, I realized I have two kids, they're 12 and nine, and they take a lot of physical risks. You know, they, they jump off ledges, they go sailing, blah, blah, blah. And I find that very hard. And I realize I don't trust myself in those situations. So you often think of trust as something that you give other people or you place in other people. But how you trust yourself and how others trust you is the other directional force that in many ways shapes your behavior even more, defines who you are, because it's where you give yourself permission to take risks. And it's often a sign of when you need to control things is when you don't trust yourself. That's when the control mechanisms kick in. Yes. I think that this is why intuitively we, we all know that. And sometimes we talk about it, how we trust people who are self-confident. And I think that self-confidence very often comes from people's confident relationship with the unknown. They trust their ability to somehow figure it out and they exude that energy that contributes to creating trust with others. I find it really fascinating and so keen to dive deeper into that, especially in the context of organizations and the dynamics that play out there. But you hinted at something that I want to unpack as well, the importance of trust. And I think, you know, for most of our listeners, we are probably preaching to a choir 
people know that trust is the glue of life and it's the most essential ingredient for relationships at work. But I wonder whether we really understand why trust is so important, especially at work. What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> I think it's a word that we throw around a lot, like a word that's sort of become, unfortunately, a bit like innovation or disruption or even, dare I say it, like diversity, like something that we have to have. But how to actually nurture trust in cultures and create environments where people feel trusted is incredibly difficult. And the one thing, you know, leaders are like, well, oh, I'm going to measure it. I'm going to make it part of our survey. Well, you're like, yeah, trust is a belief. It's highly contextual. It's highly subjective. So show me a measurement survey that's going to do that. So what you have to look for is the indicators, the signals that you go, okay, there's a high trust culture because of the way people are behaving, which we can talk more about. But, you know, when, when people say to me, oh, I'm going to make trust a value, I'm like, oh, don't do that. The worst is like a marketing, a communications campaign where it becomes like the mission statement. We're going to be the most trusted brand in the world. Or it sounds so cliche to say, but it really does start with leadership at all levels. How are they earning trust and how are they giving trust? Because often you have to, it's like a loop, and often you have to give trust before you can receive trust. And that's why it's very, very closely linked to, to vulnerability, that sometimes you have to let go, make yourself vulnerable, give that trust to another person for the trust to come back. I think it might be a really great jumping off point to explore that in more depth, because a lot of our listeners are really interested in, right, so how can I, right, how can I, for example, cultivate a culture that encourages trustworthiness and makes people feel like they are trusted and can trust their colleagues? So you talked about vulnerability as being one of the ingredients, and you talked about giving trust sometimes first before we can get trust. How does it show up in practice in organizations that you know and, and work with, especially, I understand, on the part of the leaders, because you're saying very often they need to take the first step in this dance. I'm trying to think of how to break it down into some actionable steps. So let's look at it at a more macro level and then sort of come to a behavioral level of what you're trying to nurture in a trustworthy culture. So at a macro level, what you're actually trying to sort of eliminate is micromanagement. So when people are constantly monitoring each other, which can feel like surveillance if you're on the other end of that, when people are constantly feeling like they have to demonstrate what they're doing and being really productive. And that can be, you know, as simple as showing that you're live on Slack and that you're not resting or away. There's all ways that people show that sort of being active and productive when they're not really thinking or doing their jobs. Or, you know, there's a lot of cultures where you have lots and lots of CCs on an email and then tons of BCCs. And you know that, right? You know that it's a culture where everyone needs to know everything. Ask yourself why, like, why does that micromanagement exist? Now, in some organizations, it's for health and safety reasons, right? It's there to actually manage real risk that keeps people safe. But organizations with high trust cultures, they know how to let go and give people control. So I was talking to this admiral in the Navy of how he created a high trust culture. And he has this wonderful expression, which is called the con. Now, you may have watched Star Trek, where it's like, you have the con. Now, I think this is such a beautiful visual way of thinking about it, is what you want to do is if you're in a situation uh, as a leader, where you need to take back control, you actually have to signal that to your people. So what he says is taking back the con. I'm taking back the con now. And then when the danger has passed, whether that's 10 minutes or three weeks, he says, giving back the con. I'm giving you back control. And this is, I think, it doesn't happen in most organizations, right? You take control away because you feel like there's an urgency or an emergency and you don't signal that you're giving back control. So where is their micromanagement? 
why is there micromanagement? Is it for real reasons of control or is it just because you've got to monitor and watch what people are doing and that they've got to always feel that they're on? Yes. Oh my gosh. And I so agree with that. And I love the this idea about creating a language that that gives us clarity around who's in control now, who's in charge and why. And and when situations demand it, it's okay to do it, but then we need to be clear when we're giving the comp back. And I wonder, you know, and it's a little bit of a vicious circle, I suppose, there for a lot of people, or this is how they feel, where they say, you know, honestly, I would love to not to micromanage, but when I don't control people all the time, they don't do what they're supposed to do. What do you have to say to that? They don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't do it to the standard that I want them to do it. On and on and on and on. And it's it's got worse with remote work, like on hybrid working. I would say, uh, well, this is the second thing, is are you in a culture that is very clear on expectation setting? So often people don't deliver to the level that you expect, not because they don't care enough or they're not capable enough, they're not clear on the expectation. And I find it astonishing the number of leaders and managers I say, have you ever been trained on expectations? Have you ever been trained on how to set a clear expectation with people? And they're like, no. I'm like, what do you think you're a good expectation setter? And they're like, I'm really good at setting deadlines. Yeah, a deadline is a time frame, (laughs) right? And I find this really interesting that goals are not expectation setting, right? Deadlines, projections, all these things that are meant to drive people forwards. And then you've got people sitting there completely lost of what is expected of me. And, you know, we have to remember that we've got generations coming into the workforce. Some of them have never been in an office culture. They've never sat in a meeting. They've never experienced that energy and dynamics. So the amount of teaching and learning that we have to give people to expect them to be able to deliver the work, I think is is something that's really underestimated. And it's it's so easy to go, oh, that lazy generation or that disengaged generation, right? But if you become a master in expectations, it can transform how you work with people. This is such a perfect segue for us to shift gears a little bit and talk about the challenges and opportunities of building trust in remote or hybrid environments. But I want to unpack what you said about creating expectations and getting really good at that. What are the key things that we need to do to create that clarity of expectations with our team members. Let's say that I have someone new who is going to be responsible for this show's production. Like, how do I go about creating clarity of expectations with this new person, with a new production manager? Is this a real situation? Well, actually, no, I'm super (laughs) happy with our current production manager, but theoretically speaking, you know, because I think a lot of our listeners can listen to the show. They know that there is a role like that. So it might be a helpful example. Oh, it's a good example. So if I was hiring and onboarding your production manager, the first thing I do is I would share an experience. So I would say to them, I just want to sit down with you and I want to play you a show that I'm really proud of. And together on video, you would listen to that show. And as you're going along, you could sort of say, you see this moment, like this is, this is goal. This really connects with the listeners, right? So you haven't got into the technicalities of the role. You are showing him what's important to you. It's that experience that I was talking about. And then afterwards, you backtrack. So you go, let me tell you all the steps that went into producing this show. So this is the end product. And now we're going to walk through how that happened. And you literally go through the journey of producing a great show. And then once you've mapped that out and you do it together, so you don't always, you know what those steps are, but it's not like just handing a document saying, here you go. You say, look, every step of the way, I want you to ask questions, like detail questions about how do you book a guest and how do you deal with their assistance? And what happens if there's a technical issue, like all these questions. And then at the end, you say, right now, uh, let's talk about your role in this journey, like your role in this steps. And so you go through and what you're doing is they're owning it, right? They're, They're owning it. You're not like forcing it upon them. 
and you're in it together, right? You are by each other's side and you're aligned through this is what I expect. This is the golden experience we're trying to create. I want you to care about this as much as me. Here's the journey to get there. Now, here's your role. And then you go, play it back to me. Play it back to me. Wow. My immediate reaction is I actually did it a year and a half ago when we hired our new production manager and I've made some mistakes and I wish, you know, I could go back and, and change it because we created a very clear process with every single step that is involved in creating a great show. But that initial element of sitting down together and watching or listening to a show that I'm really proud of and creating that experience of what great looks like. And I think it's so important what you said, that it is it, it has to be an experience. You know, it's not and sharing that experience to me in what you have just described strikes me as incredibly important as well. Because you could easily say, hey, this is one of the episodes that we are really proud of, just listen to it and figure out, you know, why it works. And that's one way of doing it. But I think what you've just said about sitting down together with this person, having this experience together is really powerful. And then having a conversation about it. And the second thing that I've done wrong, and I think the reason was I was so incredibly busy back then, I actually prayed that this person wouldn't have any questions. And that they would figure figure it all out on their own. I can only imagine that for a lot of people it's the case. They, you know, they throw tasks at people and they pray that everything will be clear so that we can move on with other stuff that we have. So what you're saying is clearly we need to invest in this. It doesn't just happen, you know, you cannot send that document and be done with. But I can totally see how that investment pays off in time, 100 percent this is a guess, but I'm thinking 99% of people receive a written job description over email. And then like me, when I used to be employed by other people, I'd show up and I go, I have no idea what to do. Like, I have no idea how to behave. I have no idea what's expected of me. And it's like, we'll go figure it out. And something's really important about this dynamic. And the reason why the shared listening experience is often when we bring people onto a team, we create what's called a power over dynamic. I'm now giving you your role and you're going to do this. That's a power over way. And one of the things that we actually see, particularly in younger generations, is they're looking for a power to dynamic. Now, you can say, well, they don't respect hierarchy and they don't respect sort of leadership and they don't look up. No, they are looking for those like peer to peer connections because that's the world that they've grown up in. So any organization can create some kind of shared experience to bring people into an organization. It actually, it doesn't matter what the role is. Every organization can define what excellence is or what quality looks like to them. Show people that from day one and get them to buy into that experience and align with you. Love it. What other generational dynamics influence trust in the workplace? Rachel, I know that this is a topic that really, really interests you. So I'm sure that you have a lot of golden nuggets to share with us. Yeah, I'm going to say, look, I'm very early in my research on this and thinking about this. And it's come from a point of frustration of people sort of, if I'm blunt, writing off generations, right? Just saying these generations, they don't want to work as hard. They're less engaged. And, you know, if you look at any survey, that's what it's showing. I think the latest survey by Gartner was like 21% of employees are engaged. Like that's really sad and depressing. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, so like anything, I, I sort of start with a question, which is like, well, are they really trusting less or are they trusting differently? Because the way I've always thought of trust is it's like energy. So you don't destroy energy. It, it constantly changes form. And that's what's happening with generations as they come into the workforce. I worked in an era where, you know, I started off my career in a big consulting firm, very hierarchical, very laddered, very clear job titles. You looked up to the partners, you looked to them when you could speak. Your motivation was promotion, sort of the next job title and the next salary band. That makes no sense to younger generations, most people, because it's not how they think about reward. It's not how they think about motivation. You may have read this, but the analogy I often give is this game 
of Tetris versus this game of Roblox. I don't know if you've heard me talk about this. No, I haven't. Please share it with our listeners as well. Did you play the game Tetris growing I up? I did, yes. So yeah. how would you describe Tetris, like playing that game? Oh, it was a long, long time ago. And I'm not a great game player. So let me see if I can remember it right. So basically Tetris is about fitting blocks into a frame. That's what it is. These blocks, they're called Tyronimos and they fall from the sky and your role as the gamer is to organize them. The blocks are all made up of four identical blocks and they're bounded by a square. It's very, very linear. It's very, very top down. And if you look at uh, the person who designed it, there's a great film out. Uh, it was to create this sense of order out of chaos. It was to actually, the reason why it was addictive is you had the feeling that you were in control and the rules were very simple and they were bounded. Now, the world of work I grew up in was very much like a game of Tetris and those boundaries and those rules, they were set by the employer, not the employee, right? I was handed a game to play and I followed the rules. So I have a 12-year-old son and his name is Jack. And I, I found my Nintendo Game Boy and I was so excited to show him. And I was like, oh, do you want to play Tetris? And he like picked it up. And like 30 seconds later, and he's like, uh, why on earth would you ever want to play this game, mom? And I said, <laughs> I spent hours of my youth playing this game. And he said, yeah, but mom, you can never beat the system. Oh. You can never beat the system. There's nothing mm -hmm. to design. There's nothing to create. So fast forward. He plays Roblox. Now, Roblox is like Minecraft, right? They invent worlds. The moment he's like invented these avatars and limited edition of t-shirts that he's selling for NFTs. <laughs> he's 12 years old, right? I said to him, why do you love Roblox? And he said, because it's my world and my rules. You can't beat the system. It's my world and my rules. He's 12. So what he might enter the workplace 10 years time. By 2026, almost 30% of the workforce is going to be Gen Z, Jack's generation, the Roblox generation. And yet we are trying to play Tetris in a Roblox world. Totally. We are trying to manage people as if it was a game of Tetris. And this generation's coming in, they're like, but I grew up playing Roblox. I invented my own world. I invented my own rules. I created my own incentives. I was flipping NFTs at 12 years old, right? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, so I'm curious, do you think that this is the end and the death of hierarchy, this generation, once they fully inhabit and maybe are the majority of our workforce? Does it mean that the, the way our organizations are organized will no longer be relevant? Are we entering the era of self-organized teams? What are your thoughts on that? I don't think it's the end of hierarchy. I think it's end of hierarchy as we know it. People, they still like boundaries. You know, anyone with children will know that sometimes when they are really playing up, they want to push against a wall. I'm not saying employees are like children, but we like to know where we stand. We like roots. We like structure. We like systems. We like processes. So what has gone away, and you could argue this isn't a bad thing, it's that sort of deferential hierarchy. Like just because you have the title, I should follow what you say I should do. No, I'm going to question that. I'm going to challenge that. So that is hugely confronting to generations of people that have worked really hard to become that senior vice president. You know, and 20 years in, they expect people to listen to them. So I'd say it's that looking up that kind of hierarchy. And you can see it in other parts of society because, you know, what we see about people not trusting experts or people not trusting leaders and scientists and politicians, it's the same thing. Really, in many service-based jobs or knowledge-based jobs, this concept of self-authorship has to be at the center of most roles. You know, I was looking at studies at the World Economic Forum and uh, over 80% of Gen Z say that they would rather work for themselves or a startup. Now, you could say, well, maybe people don't realize how hard it is to work for yourselves or for a startup. But what they're saying there is, I want control. I want the creativity. I want self-authorship. So I, I do think even in really traditional organizations, like how work is redesigned to feel more like a portfolio 
that you manage. And it's not a job defined by functions. It's discrete projects that you've got to get done and that you band together on these teams and there's lots of momentum and movement and energy. That to me is what the future is going to look like in knowledge and professional service-based industries. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. And I think in knowledge and professional services, particularly, I'm quite familiar because of my career in consulting. It has been this way for a really long time. So you really had quite a significant autonomy as to what projects you are working on or where you want to give your energy. And it was almost like a marketplace, really, where when you develop a good reputation, going back to our topic of of trust, then people will want to work with you and you will get to work on the projects that are interesting to you. But I think it's quite a new concept to other industries and other organizations, relatively new concept. I'm curious, what advice do you have for leaders who want to adapt their company culture and they, the way they manage their young generation to this new reality? Apart from the sort of portfolio kind of jobs, what else should they be thinking about or doing to create a more attractive work environment for, for young people? You've probably heard of this concept of tea people, not like cup of tea, like tea very broad interests and curious people, but then they have some deep skill or some deep expertise. And this isn't a new idea, but I think it's an idea that needs reinventing and is is very relevant today. So how do you enable people to explore all different roles and fields and keep them curious, but yet develop that T? Right. So, so give them a skill or an expertise that they can build their reputation around. I still think many learning and training and development programs are still very skill based versus aligned with a personality fit. So what is that person really curious about? You know, what do they have real energy about? What do they ask tons of questions about? Their tea might lie in that space versus you know what, you really should get better at Excel sheets. So we're going to send you on a training course for that. Th- that is not belittling HR programs. It's just, it's it's so capability focused. And I think if you look at what's going to differentiate humans versus technology and machines, it's not what we call those positive capabilities. It's what we call negative capabilities. So it's the ability to doubt things. It's the ability to embrace the unknown and to be able to sit with uncertainty, anything that is based on sort of a hard skill and a known outcome, we're going to outsource that to a machine. So I would say, really look at the way you hire, look at the way you train, look at the way you give feedback, look at the way you reward people, all those signals and mechanisms that are a part of HR and culture. What are they reinforcing? And I would guess that when you have a picture of that, you look at the whole picture from the way someone is entering an organization to the way they reach sort of the highest levels, most organizations are going to be focused on hard capabilities. That's a huge opportunity, right? To redesign that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm mindful of time. I want to shift gears for one last time before we move to the rapid fire questions. But before we go there, I want us to talk about fixing trust issues in the workplace. Because again, that's one of the challenges that a lot of our listeners are facing, where trust is broken, whether it's trust in leadership or whether it's trust in one of the team members. It tends to be quite hard to fix things. And people are at a loss as to... A, I think whether it's really possible to repair and B, where do you start and how do you go about it? Oh, so the first thing I'd say is you want to catch trust when it's wobbling, not when it's broken down. I have a framework, I call it the three Ds and it's really how to spot when trust is shaking and cracking. And this works sort of in a virtual environment or face-to-face. So the first D is defensiveness. The second D is disengagement. And then the last D is disenchantment. So defensiveness is quite easy to spot in people because it's when they start pushing back and they are resistant to doing things, not in a healthy sort of friction way. It's just becoming difficult all the time. Now, 
when you think about that situation, that person is still engaged. There's energy. They still care. It's just directed in the wrong place. Uh, now you want to catch it there. And I'm going to go into how you catch it there. But if you think about disengagement, the person sort of pulled back. They don't really care. They're showing up late. They're making up excuses. And then the most dangerous phase is disenchantment. So then they have walked away, even if they physically haven't walked away. And their single goal becomes to destroy you, to destroy the organization and to take other people with them on this journey because they don't want to be alone, right? They want to feel like they're right. And this is when you get employees really turning against companies uh, in quite a dangerous way. So I don't know if that resonates with you, but that's, that's one thing is, is catch it in that firsty in the defensiveness phase. It hugely resonates and it kind of aligns with my experiences with trusts as well. So it always felt to me that once trust is truly broken, it's very, very hard to repair it. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it's definitely very, very hard. And I definitely hear you on catch it when it's wobbly. You said it's like stages. So basically the first thing that we are going to see is defensiveness. Mm -hmm. Where people kind of find excuses or push back. How do we catch them there? And what do we do to fix it? Yeah. So this is then the time for what I call the uncomfortable conversation. And the reason why most trust breaks down is because we hate the uncomfortable conversation, right? And this has become a cultural problem because many organizations, they say, oh, I want to create a comfortable culture. You don't want a comfortable culture. You want a culture where people trust one enough that they can sort of argue and have that kind of tension and walk away. I, this actually goes back to my Jewish roots. Like when I first brought my husband in, he thought we all hated each other around the Friday night dinner table because we <laughs> disagree and shout and then give each other a hug at the end of the evening. <laughs> but to give you a practical framework for having this uncomfortable conversation, it's actually, it goes back to why we trust people, the traits of trustworthiness. So what you're looking for is if you imagine why we trust people, why don't we trust them? It's based on our capability and our character. And when we talk about capability, we're talking about someone's competence and their reliability. And when we're talking about their character, we're talking about their empathy and their integrity. What you want to do is you want to go back and to ask yourself, where did trust fracture? Was it because that person really was incompetent? They didn't have the skills or the resources or the time to do what they said they were going to do. Was it actually more to do with reliability? They were always late. They didn't respond when you expected. They were always rescheduling meetings, always overrunning meetings, that type of thing. That's the capability issue. And then a character issue is really different. So if it's empathy, it's like, we just don't feel like they care or they don't support other T people or they don't really think about how their actions impact others. Uh, that's an empathy fracture. And then the last one, hardest one to fix, is an integrity issue. Because integrity is when you go, hmm, that person isn't on our side anymore. That person's motives and interests are very much misaligned with the team or the culture or the organization. And if it's an integrity issue, you have to say, can I bring that back to some kind of alignment? Can we align these interests? So once you understand competence, reliability, integrity, and empathy, you can have quite a structured conversation with someone because you can go, do you know what? Like when you show up for meetings late or you're always rescheduling meetings, there's an assumption there that your time is more important than other people's. And this is how it's perceived. And this is where I've received feedback. So how can I help you fix that? What is it you need to fix that problem? Is it that you need a text to always show up on time? Is it someone you need someone to remind you, don't reschedule the meeting again? It's very different from someone who's like, yeah, you just don't care. Like that conversation. So comes full circle back to context. You can't say to someone that you don't trust them. That is just going to lead to an emotional, visceral reaction. You have to give them a reason why. You have to see whether you both agree with that reason. And then you have to find a path forward where both of you feel supported. And the amazing thing is that when you go through a good trust reset, the relationship can actually be stronger on the other side. Both sides go, 
oh, I feel understood or actually that I never knew that about the other person. It's like information gathering versus an attack, which is when you say, I don't trust you or even worse, you just think I don't trust you and that narrative becomes a downward spiral. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one concept that comes up for me here is what I've learned from Kim Scott, who was a guest on the show as well. And she talks about this framework predominantly around feedback. And uh, she has two axes. One is caring and one is being really candid with people. And w- what you've just described, it's I think for me, it's important that it really comes from the place of caring. And in the example that you've given, this is exactly how it landed with me that this person has my back. They've observed something. They're presenting the facts objectively. They're sharing the inference that they're making about what's what might be happening, how it might be perceived. But then they're also really leveling with me and saying, right, how can we fix it? How can I help you fix that? So I have your back. I'm doing this because I really care, genuinely care about you. Which in a way, it's, it sounds to me, it's a little bit meta because it sounds like in order to fix trust that is wobbly, you can only do it by building trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to fix trust issues if trust isn't there. And that's why, you know, you've probably heard other people talk about like trust is something that is continuous. It's something that you earn through these micro moments, not these grand gestures. It's like a continual practice. And We really need trust in times where it is difficult and difficult can be a global pandemic and difficult can be an employee that isn't behaving the way that we expect. That is the role of trust is actually to sort of be that foundation and that bubble, if you like, that holds people when there is some kind of tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, our time is almost up. So I want us to move to the rapid fire questions section of the show. And this is a moment where I'm going to ask you five questions in rapid succession. (laughs) And the challenge here is that you try to answer all five in under two minutes. Two minutes. Two (laughs) minutes. (laughs) I got this. I got this. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Let's go for it. At Culture Brains, the company that I run, our mission is to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. And I'm curious whether you have one tip for uh, people around how to create more sense of meaning at work. Inject curiosity. Find all different ways to inject curiosity. And that can be asking people for recommendations, asking people why. That's my short answer question. Curiosity. Okay, cool. What are the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? That they talk about one another behind their back. Do you admire any companies for the culture? And if yes, why? Oh, I find that really difficult because uh, in large organizations, you tend to find cultures within teams that are extremely positive due to the leadership. But I love small businesses. Like there's a local wine shop and the way they run that and the culture that they've created. So I find it really hard to think of examples of culture at scale. They're much more about pockets and particular people. Fair enough. What are the books? And it can be something that is within the genre of business books, but also philosophy or even literature. But what are the books that you believe would help our listeners, those folks who are interested in cultivating a culture where people do their best work? Ooh. So I I read a lot of these books and most of them are very bad. So surprisingly (laughs) so. I think The Culture Code by Dan Cole is a classic. Yeah, he's very tangible in the way he talks about culture and goes through lots of different examples. I also think Aaron Mayer is a really important uh, book, The Culture Map. So thinking about cultural differences and why people respond to change in different ways. So yeah, they're the two that are coming to mind that might be relevant to this audience. Okay, fantastic. So final question. What is the question that I haven't asked you yet, but I should have? Oh, you've asked some really good questions. I guess what is one thing you or we don't really understand about trust? What is it? I don't think 
we understand whether how we're going to trust artificial intelligence and the decisions that it will make, whether that will be the same as human trust. What a fascinating topic. We need to bring you back to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, it was such a delightful and insightful conversation. Thank you so much. I'd love for you to share what are the best places uh, where people can learn more about you, your work? Perhaps you have some resources that you would like to share with our audience. What are the best online places for people to go to? So I am very passionate about a community I run called Rethink with Rachel. It started as a newsletter and has become something bigger than that. And we rethink things and it's a lot of fun and there's great people in there. So you can find that if you're on Substack, uh, you can find Rethink with Rachel. And then I also share a lot of that content on LinkedIn as well. So you can just find me under Rachel Botsman. That's the ongoing conversation. I'm not going to plug podcasts or books because if you really you want to connect and you want to share your ideas with me and other people, that's the place to go. That's wonderful. But I definitely love your show, Rethink with Rachel. So I definitely recommend it and your books as well. So we're going to put the links in the show notes. And once more, Rachel, thank you so much for being on the show. But most of all, thank you for doing the work that you are doing because we cannot possibly survive without trust and certainly not at work. And so gaining a deeper understanding on trust and how we can cultivate it is so incredibly important. So thank you for everything that you are doing for us. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Anis and Labarawi, production manager. Sound producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. Thank you for spending your time with Rachel and me on this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found this chat insightful, inspiring, or useful, I'm guessing you did since you're still here, then I think you'll love the conversation I had with Dan Coyle, whose work Rachel mentioned in the interview. And there is a link to his episode in the show notes. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the follow button on the Culture Lab podcast in your favorite listening app. And if you could do me a solid, take a few seconds to share this episode. Could be on social media, text, an email, or even just with one other person. Just copy the link from your app and send it to a friend, someone who's keen on finding fresh, practical ways to foster an awesome company culture and ask them to give it a listen and then maybe get together and chat about what you've both learned. Because when podcasts like this spark conversations and those conversations turn into actions, that's when we start making real changes in the workplace together. And if you are looking to dig deeper into these topics and connect with others who are shaping the culture within their organizations, I think you could consider joining Culture Brains. It's a unique culture accelerator program and a global community all about shaping the future of work. To find out more, head over to tinyurl.com forward slash culturebrained. The link is in the show notes. Thanks again for tuning in. If you want to get free resources on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser agabayer.com forward slash resources. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, please do it now. That's the best way you can support our work. And finally, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform that you listen to. Thank you. And you are amazing for listening to this point. Not many people do. 